God's word for us this day. From Mount Hor, God's people set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous, fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Friends, here ends our scripture readings for this morning. May God add a blessing to our hearing and understanding of God's holy word. Well, this morning, as you might have already noticed, I have reversed the, our usual scripture reading progression. Instead of reading first from the Old Testament and then from the New, we followed a pattern that I have established and one that we regularly adhere to of having the preacher read the text on which the preacher is preaching. So yes, I am going to be preaching from Numbers today, but I also reversed the Old to New Testament progression because it is also Star Mount's tradition to end the first scripture reading with the reader saying, this is the word of the Lord, to which the congregation responds, thanks be to God, All right? So today of all days, however, you and I have just heard one of those troubling, confusing, downright bizarre stories from the Bible. And since Christ followers are supposed to try to speak the truth in love, I certainly don't want to put any of us in the, in the compromised position of having to potentially lie in church. Because today's Bible story of the attack of the five very poisonous snakes in the wilderness is probably not one of the ones that we are prepared to chime in with. Thanks be to God. It's a strange little story full of potentially frightening conclusions. In a nutshell, God sends poisonous serpents to bite and kill God's people for nothing more than murmuring and complaining against God and God's chosen leader Moses. And the only comfort seems to be that Moses intervenes on the people's behalf. Moses asks God to take away the death-dealing snakes, which, by the way, God does not do. However, God does allow Moses to fashion a poisonous serpent made of bronze and put it up on a big stick, and when the people are bitten and the stick with the poisonous snake is raised, the people can look up to it, and they are healed. The Bible tells us later that the people give this bronze serpent a name. They call it Nehushtan, so you can really impress your friends the next time you play biblical trivia, trivial pursuit. And I ask you in all honesty, is this a word of the Lord that you and I can be thankful for? The story is not an easy one. It brings back all of the distasteful stereotypes of God, the God of the Old Testament, being a vengeful and spiteful God. And let's face it, snakes are so unpopular, an animal that Hollywood has made an action-adventure horror flick called Snakes on a Plane. In fact, 49% of women and 22% of men suffer from ophidiophobia, which is fear of snakes. So what is the magic bullet to help you and me understand this story? 
What angle do we view it from? What lens do we read it through? Where do you and I find the good news? For 2 Timothy 3.16 reminds, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Really? Well, from a literal point of view, a literary point of view, this story is the last in a long line of murmuring stories. Stories that describe the tendency of the people to murmur or complain against God and against their leader Moses. Throughout the story of the Exodus, people wander through the desert wilderness, and while they wander, they complain. It's too hot, we're thirsty, we're hungry, we're tired, we're sick, we're scared, we're bored. This trip is taking too long. The majority of the people's complaints against God are directed to Moses, since he is the leader of God's people. That's why Moses, pastors, and other religious leaders have had to build broad shoulders from time immemorial. However, did you notice from the story this morning that people's complaints are directed directly to God? And God's response is quick and deadly. God becomes the exasperated mother on a 12-hour car trip to Disney World. The kids are complaining in the back seat. Are we there yet? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I gotta go. He hit me. No, she hit me first. Looking in her rearview mirror, the mom says, Now don't you make me stop this car and go back there or you will be sorry. Well, parents rarely follow through with such threats. But when they do, Katie bar the door, there is heck to pay. And here in the book of Numbers, it is one of those times when God does stop the car. God does go back there. Fed up with the whining of the people, God sticks to God's word. Except this time it's not just a spanking that the people receive. God's murmuring, complaining children get God so mad that God starts eliminating the problem by eliminating the source. God starts eliminating God's people. And as queasy as this story should make us, to think that God can act so violently. What makes you and me even more uncomfortable is that you and I know all too well what we are capable of. We know that we can murmur and complain about God's blessings and God's providential care with the very best. I know, God, that you have blessed me with a job and I've kept this job through the Great Recession, but I don't like my boss and the pay is too little and the hours are not great and I work with a bunch of idiots. I know, God, I have a roof over my head and I've been blessed with food on the table every night, but my house isn't as big or as grand as my neighbor's, and I don't have enough closet space, and the kitchen needs remodeling, and I'm tired of cooking. I know, God, I am fundamentally healthy, but... I'd really like to lose those last 10 pounds. And I can't play tennis like I used to. And I wish you'd made me a little taller. What I find particularly interesting about the Israelites' murmurings and our own is that you and I rarely complain about what we lack. God blesses you and me. God cares for you and me so well that you and I rarely lack for anything. No, we rarely complain about what we lack. Instead, we complain about what we have been given. Thanks 
But no thanks, God. Your blessings are just not enough. They don't measure up to my standards. They don't meet the standards and expectations I have come to believe are right for me and my life. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. It's like the joke that Woody Allen opens the movie Annie Hall with. Two elderly women are at a Catskill Mountain Resort, and one of them says, Boy, the food in this place is really terrible. And the other responds, Yeah, I know, and such small portions. You and I are difficult. We're difficult to please, aren't we? God's people complain that there is no food, which is a lie. Then, as if thinking better of it, the Israelites admit that, yes, there is food, It's just that the food, the blessing, the manna that they have received from God is just not to their liking. I hear this story and I think about the many blessings in my life, how many gifts I have received from God that I have murmured over because they were wonderful and generous. Yes but they just weren't exactly what I was fishing for. How many times do, you, do I find myself entitled to more than I have? How many times do I face God in prayer, and instead of saying, wow, God, thank you for waking me up this morning, Thanks for breakfast. Thanks for family. Thank you for job. Thank you for help. Thank you for a roof over my head. Thank you for friends. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, that you take good care of me. Instead of that prayer, I say, why not more, God? Why not better, God? Why not right now, God? Why not exactly as I asked, exactly as I wanted, exactly as I thought best, God? Come on, step it up already. I'm waiting. In our consumer-driven American culture, You and I have first world problems. We have virtually unlimited choice, an entire economy committed to catering to our most minute personal preferences. What kind of cell phone cover do you want? Green, black, zebra striped glitter, shiny, matte finish, Rigid plastic or that kind of jelly, rubbery kind of stuff, right? Do you want it with a stand? Do you want it with a clip? Do you want it with a face cover? Do you want it just the bumpers around the edge, right? Would you like something with a design or logo? I typed in cell phone cases on Amazon.com, and I got a mirror 3,960,000 cell phone cases to choose from. Yeah, I know, not all of them will fit my phone. I got that, but okay, nevertheless, it's a big number. The gift of unlimited choice can be very, very dangerous. Suddenly, it is seducing us, whispering in our ear like that first snake murmured to Eve, it could be a little better, Eve. You have every blessing from God, every good and imaginable gift, except this one, this one thing, this fruit of the tree that you've been waiting for. And you just gotta have it. How quickly 
you and I can fall into believing that our entire lives should be catered to by everyone and everything that surrounds us. And what an easy shift it is to bring these ideas to bear on our spiritual lives. To come to expect that God should serve me, give me exactly and only everything that I want and not the other way around. We begin to expect our spouses to be perfectly matched to all of our personal preferences. Our work should be personally fulfilling every day. Our friends should always meet our expectations. Our church should tell us only what we want to hear, and sermons should never be boring, and the choir should never sing off of key. And if they do not, you and I wonder if we can call customer service to get an exchange. Surely there is something better out there that will provide us a little bit more satisfaction And God often becomes the operator on the other end of the helpline. And our prayers often become little more than laundry lists of complaints. You and I become murmurers. We become whiners. We bellyache and gripe about what is not to our liking, not quite up to snuff in our lives. It can become a droning drumbeat of minor dissatisfactions that color our lives every day and shape our relationships with God and our leaders and our friends in significant ways. God begins to become nothing more than a means to an end for us. We forget the generosity, and the abundance of the giver, and we only want to focus in on the deficiencies of the good gifts that we have already received. And while I don't think that you and I have to worry about God sending poisonous snakes to bite us and kill us, I do think that murmuring and complaint deadens us just the same. The constant murmur of complaints under our breath, the lack of gratitude, our failure to count our blessings, sucks all of the air out of our ability to live life, the abundant life that God promises and God gives. You and I are so busy focusing on what's not going to our specifications that we lack the energy to be thankful for all that we do have, the multitude of blessings that we have received. The murmurs numb us to the many joys that God brings us every day. The complaints transform our relationship with God from one characterized by thanksgiving to a relationship characterized by bitterness and unmet expectations. Murmuring is insidious, says the story from the book of Numbers, and it leads to death. It can seep into every last nook and cranny of our lives, leaving us judging all that surrounds you and me, leaving us believing that we are entitled to more, to better, to my way. Sure, this manna is a great miracle that's feeding us and kept us alive in the wilderness. Yes, it's a miraculous gift from a good and gracious God, but it's just not enough. We deserve a bigger miracle, God, Maybe we even deserve a bigger and better God than you. Murmuring, dear friends, destroys our ability to enjoy our lives and to be in a right relationship with our God. It's always amazing to me how a life or death matter will quickly put things into perspective for many of us. When we walk away from a car accident, when someone T-bones us in the intersection, or the shadow on the x-ray turns out to be nothing, or the calm after the panic, when we find our missing toddler in the store four aisles over, or when the pregnancy test comes back with a hoped-for result for a few days or weeks, every moment surrounded by our loved ones is a little more precious. 
the air we breathe is a little sweeter. Worship seems to bring us closer to God. We are grateful for every single day of good health. We're paying attention to all that's right with the world, and we recognize the miracle of our very existence. And then those feelings, they begin to wane, and you and I find ourselves murmuring about who left the cap off the toothpaste and complaining that our blessings don't seem to be abundant or as good or as tailor-made to our every want as we desire. We murmur to God that you and I deserve a little bit bigger miracle than the one that we've already gotten. Now, I'm not suggesting that God sent a bunch of poisonous snakes to scare the Israelites into being more grateful for the blessings and the miracles that they had received. I can't really exactly explain what's going on here in this story. But I do know just how destructive murmuring and complaining, whining and bellyaching can be to our relationships with God, with others, and even our future. Well, the end of Lent is fast approaching, but brothers and sisters, it is not too late for you and me to try a new spiritual discipline in the time that we have left. So let us set aside our constant murmuring hum of personal complaints that each one of us carries. And when they do creep into our conversation, both out loud and in our heads, let us be reminded of how death-dealing they can be and how deadening they can be to the gift of gratitude and to our relationship with the divine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, ye say.